Welcome back to Dagish America Presents. I'm Ben Harl, host of the podcast, and as always, I am happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about the industry that I work in. Last episode, we discussed controlling the insect's life cycle through the use of growth regulators. If you haven't had an opportunity to listen to that podcast yet, I highly suggest you do. On today's episode, we'll take a look at ways to treat the grain itself to protect it from insect infestation through the use of grain protectants. And to help us today, we've invited Dr. Johnny Wilson from Central Life Sciences to join us. So please help me welcome Dr. Wilson to the podcast. Johnny, how are you doing this morning? I am doing fantastic. How about yourself, Ben? I'm doing great. Thanks uh, again for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is definitely an exciting topic for me. We're going to be talking about grain protectants today, and grain protectants are something that I've used quite a bit in my career. And I think sometimes there's maybe some misunderstanding on application, application rates, how they're applied, what they should be used for. So I'm I'm really happy to have you on the podcast today to kind of clear some of that up and then you know kind of talk about how they work and all of that stuff. But first, I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of introduce yourself to our listeners and let us know a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for the uh, platform. And to give you a little background on myself, I'm a farm kid raised in central Kansas. I uh, actually went off to school with the intention of going to vet school and oh. started doing some research on the grain processing side as an undergraduate, kind of a mixture between grain processing and feed processing, and really fell in love with it. Ran the research feed mill at Kansas State University for a while, decided to continue on with grad school and have always just kind of been focused on milling performance, the nutrition side. And that ranges from food and feed all the way from, uh, you know, just the storage portion all the way through the different processing units uh, that it can go through. After I finished my Ph.D., I uh, Spent around a decade in the uh, animal feed additives industry and really just worked with some of the larger animal feed producers on integrating different ingredients into the process. But then from a technical service perspective, just worked on performance of their overall operation, different ways that we could maximize, you know, throughput, reduce inputs and just getting a better idea of that whole process. So about two years ago, Central Life Sciences formed the technical service group, and I was brought in as the lone non-entomologist with the group. So like I said, my background is more on the processing side, but uh, I've certainly spent a fair amount of time around, around insects. And what we wanted to do was really approach it from a grain degradation story to talk about the different ways that insects uh, are extremely harmful to an operation beyond just the standard sanitation side to be able to discuss the losses from insect consumption of the grain during storage how they can change the the overall storage environment things like water activity level the overall moisture content what actually changes in that kernel as they feed and as that starch gets exposed to oxygen and begins to oxidize, starts to go through different degradation processes and really tell a much larger story beyond the, well, we have bugs, that's bad perspective. <laughs> so with that in mind, we we kind of spider webbed out a little bit and we looked at uh, what can we do from a research perspective, you know, in-house to what can we do with some third-party research site, to how do we then validate this at a commercial level, and how do those values change during scale-up to working directly with the customers on their specific operation, because not all grain storage and grain processing facilities are created equal, and some are, are just more challenging environments than other ones that are prone to more insect damage. And they might require totally different inputs than other ones, but just really making a, a keyed in approach to each operation that we're dealing with to develop a plan that works for them and not trying to take a universal approach to anything. So kind of through all of those different methods and then taking what we learn from each site and looking at how we can apply it to different customers to make sure that they have the best solution for them in place. 
So this is really interesting. I definitely think that you bring a very valuable insight into uh, what we do, you know, in protecting the world's food supply. You know, a lot of people that work in our industry come from an entomological background. So they think more about the insect than they do about the commodity that the insect actually feeds off of. And so looking at it from a nutritional perspective and how the insects will degrade the nutritional value of the commodity that we're storing, you know, that's really interesting. So I'm definitely glad to hear that you and your team are actually doing some research on that because I definitely think that's pretty important. Yeah. And and really what it boils down to, the decision makers are on so many different levels, whether it's food or feed or storage. You know, you might have the nutritionist where in a feed mill, their background is all in poultry nutrition and they're focused on that live operation while still, you know, being over the feed mill in some capacity. But there's only so many minutes and hours in the day. And how much time can they reasonably devote to this when they have a dozen other fires to put out? So (laughs) you have to put it in a sense that they can understand. And well, when we start talking about, well, the, the bird has a different chance to absorb these nutrients because that oxidation has occurred. That's the story that it plays to them versus the commodity purchaser where they understand numbers on a spreadsheet. They don't look into that grain quality aspect. They just see, well, this load is three cents a cheaper per ton. So, of course, that's the right way. And putting it in terms of these are the dollars and cents losses that you can see just in your storage side, but then also all of the different downstream touch points where processing occurs. That's how we make that inefficiency and roll it all up into a number package that they can easily digest. And the funny thing is, At the production side, these are not novel things that we're talking about. These are things that the production folks have known about for a very, very long time. When their machines operate differently, they notice. They pick it up over time. They can tell you when the switch has gone from old crop to new crop. They can tell you when buggy stuff has happened just by how their machinery operates. But we historically just haven't done a great job of connecting the dollars and cents of how much is that really costing you from an energy perspective, from a total shrink loss perspective to all of these things. So it's building that financial case to help people make decisions easier. Well, yeah, and and it's so important because the best thing that we can do as far as controlling insects is be preventative. You know, we want to try to control the stored product pests before the nutritional value of that commodity starts degrading. And I think grain protectants fall into that preventive category very, very well, in my personal opinion. You know, I, like I said, I've used them quite a bit. And, you know, the best way to protect the commodity, in my opinion, is through the use of preventative measures like grain protectants. So just for, for the folks uh, who may be listening who haven't had an opportunity to use grain protectants, let's just start out by kind of defining what is a grain protectant. Yeah, so I like to break them down into a few different classes. And to, to make it easy, I've kind of built these three different buckets. And I lump them into preventative, reactionary, and then full control. So something like a true preventative is going to be an insect growth regulator. And there's different types of insect growth regulators, but they essentially do the same thing where we are adding in a synthetic compound that mimics something that the insect naturally produces. So in the case of a product like Diacon IGR, the active ingredient is S-methoprene. Well, as insects work through their life cycle, they're naturally producing methoprene to tell them, all right, it's it's time to advance to the next stage of life. And when much like humans, we require, you know, specific amounts of those hormones and enzymes in our bodies to tell us to do the right thing and to function correctly. We're just overloading their system with that methoprene compound. And it sends their system into a state of shock and they'd never advance into adulthood. Well, if they can't advance into the next stage of life, they can't hit that reproductive age. And so that next generation doesn't happen. And you essentially stunt the population. The saying is it's like birth control for bugs. Right. You just never get that uh, next generation on board. Now, where there's some uh, disconnect on the customer side, it is going to do virtually nothing against the already established adults. They're still active. Their life cycle continues on. They're still feeding. So how much are they able to feed? Well, 
that's a loaded question because what is your you know overall insect loading what's the population look like if it's a heavy infestation already and you're adding an in an igr well all of that existing feeding pattern and damage is going to continue and it's going to really look like the product is doing nothing and in fact if you have too high of an insect loading level they can still overwhelm whatever amount that you've put in there. If there's, you know, sections that maybe didn't get uh, applied as well, they can find those little pockets and start up the population again. So that's kind of where we've, from a portfolio perspective, looked at adding in additional compounds to control more. So somewhere in between the true preventative and reactionary treatment, you have something like a Daikon IGR+. Plus. And that's where we're putting in more adulticide to take care of the adult insects and the adolescent insects. So kind of the one, two punch. And then you get into the truly reactionary products of, oh my gosh, we've got this huge adult insect population. I just need to get grain to market and I need no live insects. And that's where something like a Sentinel Synergized uh, really comes into play. And then you can add in some like buffer compounds uh, like PBO8 to get more of a faster kill on those adults. In the past, those have been referred to as rescue treatments. And I hate that term. I like <laughs> yeah. responsive. And the example I give, it's like, okay, you say rescue. Essentially, what you're doing is driving a boat out in the ocean and you're throwing a life raft to a drowning man and then driving the boat away. Yeah, he's not drowning anymore, but all that damage has still been done. <laughs> Now right, he's just yeah. sitting out in the ocean. You know, we can't go back and, and fix the damage that's been done. And my line that I like to give in the grain industry, we are the masters of blending. That's how these storage facilities make their money at the end of the day. But you can't blend away shrink. Shrink is just gone. You'll never get that portion that the insects have consumed back. So you're right. Taking that upfront preventative approach, making sure that kill has happened before the infestation starts is always the way to go. And with that in mind, we kind of roll over to that full control cycle. And some of the newest products that we're offering have bolstered levels of the insect growth regulator, the adulticide, and the PBO8 synergist to kind of overwhelm uh, the metabolic cycle of that insect, make sure that faster kill gets in there, make sure that there's residual levels of that IGR sticking around in case you get outside infestations, because one thing that a lot of folks don't think about, they'll only think about infestation from one perspective, like, oh, the grain's coming in with bugs, so I just need to kill that. Well, if you've got that in storage over nine months, what are all the different vector points? Are they getting in <laughs> yeah. through the ventilation system? Are they getting in through holes and, and vents inside of the bin? How is that occurring? Did everything get cleaned out properly? Is there stuff left over from the last load? Even though you've taken out everything coming in, you still have this constant pressure coming in. And the same is true, like vice versa. You can't just focus on stopping everything coming in from the outside while stuff snuck in alongside the grain. And having that kind of holistic approach and doing that full control is, uh, it's been very, very helpful when you're analyzing practices on an individual basis because some folks have enough process controls and they they do a great job housekeeping they have great equipment they might not need the tank they just need that extra level of protection that an igr can give they have enough management practices in place that they do a great job just with that and at the end of the day it's all about reducing pesticide usage which seems strange coming from someone that sells pesticides <laughs> yeah. to say that but really that's what's best for the the industry as a whole it's we never want to use the maximum amount the strongest that we can it's what can we do to integrate these as part of an ipm program to do the other stuff but we also have to recognize some places are just challenged from a labor perspective a management perspective and an ipm practice perspective Maybe we need to layer these extra things. And sometimes it's not even about just apply a grain protectant. And you'll be fine. Nah, grain protectant's one tool in the toolbox. That doesn't mean you're never going to have to look at fumigation. That doesn't mean you're never going to have to turn your grain. Every situation requires a unique perspective and unique control to it. Right. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned, you know, some of the goal is to try to reduce 
you know, the use of pesticides. And I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I was always under the impression through the use of grain protections. I mean, they're pretty safe to use on food and feed. Am I right on that? So that is one area where we have a, a huge advantage when it comes to the Diacon product line that has the insect growth regulator in there. The EPA actually states that it is tolerance level exempt for use in the states and it's codex approved uh, and has a pretty high level in there. But what's nice is methaprene does nothing to mammals. It's not a compound that we use in our biological functions at all, and it has no effect. In fact, the LD50 uh, ratio is lower than caffeine for humans. Right. Yeah. Now, I've, I've heard that. If you're an insect, it's a, a little bit different story. But of the different things that we can use to really control insect populations, there's not too much better. And it's really hard for insects to develop any sort of resistance because it's such a core component of their biological functions. They would have to make a few evolutionary leaps to get right. to the point where they're uh, resistant to it in any way. But that's not to say that, you know, it, it's the little pitfalls. It's the application consistency that trips people up sometimes. It's how clean is your grain? Where is this stuff going to? And that's kind of where I come into the equation a little bit because a lot of my background is with product application and the physical characteristics of grains and liquid and dry application of just because we bought this compound and sprayed it on or applied it, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's evenly coated. Uh, again, we have to right, look at that yeah. specific operation and all of these different variables of what type of grain are we applying to? How clean is the grain? What is the particle size of the grain that we're applying to versus droplet size or dry matter size? All these things that people don't think about because this is, and I got to be frank about this side, it's not something that people want to think about. It's not something our customers want to deal with. So they're not devoting a ton of mental capacity to it. It's just bugs are a problem. Get them out of here so I can continue on with my normal stuff that I should be doing. Right. Yeah. That should be our goal. We don't want to take up too much of the time because there's a thousand other things that they need to be doing from the processing and storage side. If we can be fast and if we can be efficient, then we've done our job great. No, you're, you're absolutely right on that. Yeah. And I've used growth regulators for the majority of my career. And, you know, and I've been around for about 20 years now. So, but how long have, have growth regulators been in use? Uh, I mean, is there a, a little bit of history with growth regulators? I mean, do we start out with, you know, like lesser products and kind of graduate into some of the products that are as effective as they are now? So if I recall correctly, and I might get fact checked on this one, but uh, I seem to recall that 1974 was when methoprene first came online, or at least okay. that was some of the original filings for use in uh, in stored grain protection and and stuff like that. Now, there's a few different classes. There's methoprene, there's kinoprene, there's a uh, few different ones like that. Methoprene tends to be the big one for stored grain. Kinoprene is actually uh, in some of our products more on like the greenhouse side and uh, things like that, but essentially doing the same thing just has a slightly different mode of action and performs a little bit better in different environments. But at the end of the day, they're all looking to do the same thing. And they've been around for quite a while and are still doing a great job, you know, compared to some of the other agriculture chemicals out there. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're like, they're great, great grandparents of the industry, really. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that, you know, uh, right now, all of these products that we're using for grain protectants are working very well. But you mentioned, you know, the the life cycle of the insects and, and trying to keep up with the generational life cycle of the insects and trying to stay ahead of the potential for resistance or them being able to genetically modify themselves out of the current products working. Um, so I would imagine you guys are probably doing a lot of research, doing a lot of trials, maybe on some new products or more inventive ways to use existing products. Is there any research or trials that you guys are working on right now that you could talk about? So I was pleasantly surprised when I came on board at, at Central a couple of years back at how robust our product development and, and R&D and analytical teams were. Uh, we'd host research forums multiple times throughout the year. I think it's six times a year where it's four days 
of going over what's in the pipeline, what's being done, how can we look to modify uh, products that we currently have as well as bring on new active ingredients. So it's it's always reassuring that there's additional stuff in the pipeline because I like to look at the, okay, this is working now, that's great, but we need to have a plan in place for if something shifts in our industry and needs become a lot different. So first and foremost, it's proving what we have on board right now to the right people, like what I said before, those decision makers that might be the commodity purchasers, that might be the nutritionists that have never looked at products in this way. It's more been the the quality assurance folks making sure that they can pass a, a sanitation inspection or making sure that their their loads aren't getting rejected. It's building a use case to those other folks. So with that in mind, we do have some active trials going on uh, with the USDA ARS in Manhattan, Kansas, where we are quantifying stored grain loss due to uh, insect feeding, where we are we're correcting on the moisture side because that's part of the story that's that's been told historically of, well, yeah, we know losses occur during storage, but uh, a lot of that is just due to moisture. So if we can correct on a moisture basis and say, yeah, we lose moisture, but we've canceled that out. This is your loss due to insects. It helps build a much stronger story and um, and and just make that decision making process easier. So we're looking at a few different grains, uh, corn and wheat, really, to, to start off with. And just how fast does rice weevil or lesser grain borer consume these grains? How fast do we get to the level of break point? You know, what sort of insect damage kernels are we looking at after 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Because there's this popular thought process out there of why only store my grain for two or three months? How much damage can an insect do? And the answer is a lot more than what you think. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. there's a lot of variables that play into that. Your starting insect population is probably the biggest variable. Next is temperature and humidity and, and just those growth conditions. Insects are going to grow a lot different in Minnesota than they are Alabama. That's yeah. just the fact of it. But even in some of those northern states, uh, I, I know that climate change is kind of a dirty phrase and a hot button issue in our industry. But you can't deny that there are just some years where we don't get the freeze that we have historically seen, that spring might be coming earlier and wetter than in, in previous years. This last year was incredibly challenging from a grain and, and dust mite perspective on the uh, stored feed side. I had more calls about that issue than I'd ever seen before going later into the fall. And with this year, it seems like the hatch just came much, much earlier. So geographic areas that had been, quote, protected by the cold longer, they seem to be experiencing a lot more issues, especially from the weevil side. And weevils are just tougher to kill than almost anything else. Yeah. More based on their life cycle than anything. They have this natural protection where they burrow into the kernel and then seal it up after them. So at that point, applying a protectant or an adulticide or a fumigant, well, they've built this armored shell around them and you have to get your concentration so high to have an effect. And that egg that they've laid on the inside is totally protected. They're still going to consume it and emerge. And then you're rolling the dice on, can we kill it before it burrows into another one and keeps that <laughs> yeah. cycle rolling? And a lot of times the answer is no. So unless you do it right up front, your options are kind of limited. So getting back to the to the research side, this is a, a four year process where we have multiple different studies involved. We're starting from a, kind of a small side, uh, like three, five gallon vessels uh, re with a lot more variables. And we're testing different types of protectants and adulticides, not just our portfolio. I look at this from an industry perspective. Yeah, I, I might have a CLS badge on my shirt when I go to trade shows and talk to customers, but doing what's best for the industry is is going to be my primary goal. And if our products aren't the right one for the right situation, that, that doesn't need to be what I'm pushing on folks. It needs to be what's best for them. And if there's other products out there that can perform well, then the industry at large needs to know about it. So that way we can get back to that goal of reducing pesticide usage as much as possible. Our options are just very limited with what we have. And uh, hopefully other companies have some robust product <laughs> pipelines like ours because the the list is getting shorter every every day, it seems like. 
but there's still some good products on the market and we're going through the testing and and right now the early results are very very good all the products are performing well they did a total kill uh with this first storage run they're looking at doing let's see we've got a six week a 12 week and then a couple different treatment days after that on the smaller scale side but the next summer we're going to be looking at some different storage environments. We're seeing a lot more ground piles, a lot more of those silo bags, just getting away from traditional bins out of necessity in a whole lot of cases, uh, especially looking at this summer. There looks to be some record harvest coming in, and I think people are pre-planning on uh, needing to keep some of this stuff in silo bags and and in ground piles. Hopefully they were able to at least lay out a crushed limestone bed and get retaining <laughs> walls in place. Yeah, yeah. But we just see more and more of that, even if it's for a short time until uh, export opportunities come up or until available space comes in. But being able to show how product can be applied in some of these non-traditional ways and that losses that are incurred are even greater than you know a, a vertical standing bin set is is pretty big um so those are those are the big trials and we have another one that it's not officially started yet but this is the next phase that i'm really excited about both on the wheat and corn side so so this first batch of trials is really focused on demonstrating how much that insect is able to consume and showing to those commodity purchasers and the the management team this is in a dollars and cents if you know making these numbers up but if you lose one percent at 30 days with a million bushels you're losing this many bushels of your commodity this is how much it's costing you versus this is the cost of your inputs to control it that's an, a very easy amount of napkin math to go over and they can build a use case very quickly based on that but then there's that next level of the nutrition side so looking at both corn and wheat on the wheat side we have percentage milling yield and that's kind of the, the gold standard of that industry you know they have x amount of bushels of whole wheat they're selling the flour at the end how much flour can they derive from a bushel of wheat that's that's where they're making their money and we know that insects are consuming a large portion of starch. They're going after different components in there, but on a percentage basis, they're chasing energy. And yeah. where's the most energy? Well, it's the fat and the starch. That's kind of their uh, catalyst for growth. So they're consuming more of that than, say, the bran or, or more fibrous components. And that is affecting their milling yield. Now, to what degree? There's been some small studies in the past, and there's been some really old studies in the past. I'm talking like 1960s out of the USDA and K-State. I think it's time that we uh, revisit some of those things because <laughs> yeah, not yeah. only have the the bugs progressed since then, the, we're about a thousand generations of grain removed from that. And our, our machinery and practices are just vastly different. So we are actively pursuing a trial to look at quantifying that on a small scale. And I'm actually working with a couple different commercial companies who are also doing that on a laboratory scale and looking at a larger commercial scale to help connect the dots. So that's going on on the wheat side. But then on the corn side, I've historically worked with a lot of different nutritionists and formulators on, you know, inclusion of the major ingredients in their in their diets. So let's look at swine, for example, on a normal corn soy diet you might be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 percent corn 30 percent soy and then made up of some distillers grains some specialty ingredients some uh minor ingredients vitamins minerals fat additives things like that well if your corn makes up 40 50 60 percent depending on the life cycle or life stage of the animal Normally, what they're doing is they've got values on an energy basis. You know, corn on average contains this many kilocalories per per ton, and that's how they're formulating it. Or in some of the other operations, they might be doing some some regular testing on the ingredients, but they're using so much corn that the product qualities are changing so fast. It's only ever an average of what they're seeing go through the operation. 
And we know that, again, going back to those insects were consuming the starch, you just visually think about how a, a rice weevil feeds and they burrow into that corn kernel, consume everything on the outside and leave a shell. Well, if you do approximate analysis of that shell, most of that starch is gone yeah. and a lot of that fibrous material is left over. Well, that is dramatically altering your nutritional profile that you're formulating on. So we might be shorting these. We, we definitely are shorting these animals on some of the critical nutritional components that we think we're getting in there. So now you think all of your different live animal variables, the average daily feed intake, average feed to gain ratio, all these different components. How much are we affecting that based off? Maybe, maybe you're only looking at like three, four percent insect damage kernels. Well, by the time you get to an operation that has a million hogs in it over, you know, a 120 day cycle, how much is that actually costing you? And those numbers get scary really, really fast. But it's helping those folks that haven't traditionally been exposed to this line of thinking work through this thought process. And right now we're actually doing some uh, testing in-house with different uh, starch methods and looking at how the starch is degraded from being just exposed to the oxygen and how much is being consumed by the insect. And it's really a simple process when you think about it. It's just infesting small batches of corn and running some laboratory assays to analyze, well, what's happening to the starch as it goes through 30 days, 60 days, 90 days worth of feeding? Where is that break point of okay, this is where we've established we need to have a control in place. This is how much it's actually costing us. This is how much we can afford to spend making sure that it doesn't affect us at the end of the day. And I'm really excited about both the milling yield percentage and the uh, the corn starch loss and degradation side, because I think that that is an industry that really has not looked too close at this. And there's a lot of opportunity to just show the value of, IPM practices and insect control for our industry as a whole. Yeah. And I'm really glad you and your team are looking into this. Like I was saying earlier, it's a line of thinking that I don't think is often looked at. Yeah, And I would imagine that you could probably follow that chain reaction, that nutritional deficit. You could probably follow it all the way up to your own dining room table. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if the insects are having an effect on the feed that you know, like hogs or or, or swine are, are uh, eating, and then the swine have some kind of nutrition deficit. When they end up on our dining room table, you know, we pro are probably not getting a nutritional meal either. I mean, I could be wrong on that, but I would imagine that you could trace that all the way back up to the foods that we eat, and then also the grain that we eat as well. I mean, it's not just the feed; it's it's the food that we eat as well. If there's a nutritional deficit there, we're going to know it. And at the very least, you're definitely impacting prices because if oh, that company yeah. is isn't uh, isn't producing near as much of that end quantity of meat, the well, all of a sudden, you know, it's not that like they need more excuses to increase the price of bacon. <laughs> yeah, but we've just given them another one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hey, I only have one more question for you, and I, I ask this question to all the uh, folks that join me on the podcast. What kind of advice would you give a new pest control operator, a new fumigator, you know, somebody who's brand new at using grain protectants? What kind of advice would you give them about using those grain protectants responsibly? So I like to use the example of stacking tolerances or stacking armor, if you will. If you look at modern day like body armor, it's a layered approach. There's not just one component in there. There are multiple different levels of protection added on. And that's how I go into a facility looking at, well, what's the threat actually being posed? How hard are they getting hit by those insects? How many levels of armor do we need? Certainly the base level of that armor needs to be a robust IPM practice. And that's doing the stuff that's not sexy that's sweeping the floor yeah, that's yeah. cleaning out your insect harbor points that's sampling your incoming loads and making sure that you're doing rejections right but every location that i ever go into i i have a same question that i ask every single place what's your biggest pain point 100 percent of the time it's labor it's always labor and it has not changed in a decade well if labor is your number one pain point 
that probably tells me that your IPM practice is not as great as it could be because <laughs> yeah. maybe yeah. you're not rejecting the loads that you should be. Maybe you're not sweeping the floors as much as you should be. You're not doing those bin cleanouts that like you should be. Uh, there's a good chance if I look in the plenum underneath the grain bin, it's completely full and your your fans just running against a brick wall. <laughs> yeah. So with with that in mind, you know, it would be great if everyone could do a fantastic job at IPM and we didn't have to use anything. But that's not the world that we live in. So do what we can from an a physical IPM perspective. And then what tolerances and what armor do we need to stack on top of it? Do we need to look at doing regular fumigation? Do we need to do look at doing that protection? Do we need to look at doing the IGR and adulticide and synergist and fumigation? Some facilities are legitimately at that point. So it's it's looking at it from that lens of these are the dozen or so things in my toolbox. How can I take my Swiss army knife and figure out which tools I actually need. How can I do like an a la carte approach and figure out what are the best things for this customer? And then looking at their operation, recognizing where they're challenged from and how can I fit my product solutions into a way that's going to work for them? We joke around Central Life that our biggest competitor is a guy not walking out and turning the on button on his system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's it's true to some extent. And that's uh, one of the other projects that I've worked quite a bit on that I'm happy to say has reached its endpoint is uh, reviving some of our application systems. For the listeners out there, the main products that we sell are all liquid. So that means you have to have a, a liquid pump and storage vessel and dilute the concentrated material in water or liquid and as you can imagine, that requires someone physically going out there and doing this practice. Well, it also requires you going out and flipping an on switch. So I have just kind of looked at what different components of that can we eliminate? How can we cut out as much human error as possible? We're never going to be able to get ev everything. But if we can make it easier to do, the likelihood of it actually taking place goes up dramatically. So instead of doing the dilutant process yourself, instead of having to turn on a pump, instead of having to keep inventory, we've really transitioned over into doing um, metering pump injection systems into water lines or dust suppression lines using oil. So now we've got our concentrated product in a 30 gallon vessel being dosed in with an inline metering pump into a needle injection valve. And we've got uh, PLC controlled actuated valves tied into the conveying system that say, okay, the conveyor's on and it's under load. It's time to turn on the water and turn on the product. It's all preset to dose the correct way. All they have to do is monitor the inventory level. And we can even have that tied into a cell phone that gives them alert that their inventory level is low. So just making it as easy as possible. That would be my biggest recommendation to a new fumigator about, yeah, it can be cheaper to go out to tractor supply and buy a little pump and uh, and some PEX line and a tank, slap it on a grain conveying system and just tell them, batch this up and hit go. But it might not be the best solution for them because if they never use it, it's not doing them any good. <laughs> yep, <laughs> absolutely. Well, listen, that's all I had for you today, Johnny. I really appreciate you taking some time and answering some of these questions about grain protectants. Absolutely, I'm always happy to talk about it. All right, well, hey, you take care, thanks. Thanks. I want to thank Dr. Wilson for explaining to us just how grain protectants work. They are a very important option for us to consider in the fight against stored product pests. On the next and final episode of Season 5 of Degish America Presents, we'll be talking about the future of stored product pest control. There are so many new challenges on the horizon, and luckily, we have a lot of new tools and methods to help us well into the future. And remember, if you have a question you'd like for us to answer, please feel free to email us at podcast at degishamerica.com. Or you can also find us on our website at degishamerica.com or on all of the main social media outlets. Till next time, I'm Ben Harl, and I hope you have a safe and terrific day.